My name is Jason Freeman, and I'm pleased to join you here tonight to introduce our guest, Ruha Benjamin. She's the author of Race After Technology, Abolitionist Tools for the New Jim, uh, for the new Jim Code, referred to by the nation as a galvanizing and inventive and wide-ranging look at how new technologies reinforce social inequities. And she is the author of Viral Justice, How We Grow the World We Want, a pragmatic yet poetic vision of the ways in which our minor everyday choices can add up to larger societal growth. Also the author of many scholarly publications, uh, Dr. Benjamin is a professor of African American Studies at Princeton, University's, uh, Princeton University, where she is the founding director of the Ida B. Wells Just Data Lab. Uh, her writing has been featured in the New York Times, The Guardian, CNN, The Root, and Vox, among numerous other media outlets. Tonight, she joins us with her latest book, Imagination, a Manifesto, a revelatory call to action. This work calls for readers to consider the arena of the mind as a very real space for struggle, interconnectedness, and societal change. Tonight's author will be joined in conversation uh, uh, by Chantrell P. Lewis. She is a multi-hyphen creative and scholar who accesses multiple disciplines to help elucidate African diasporic uh, history, aesthetics, culture, and spirituality. After premiering at Black Star Film Festival, her critically acclaimed directorial uh, debut, In Our Mother's Gardens, was released on Netflix via Ava DuVernay's Array. Her book, Dandelion, The Black Dandy and Street Style, was published by Aperture in 2017, and her work has been featured in the New York Times, LA Times, Variety, Hollywood Reporter, NPR, Washington Post, and I should just list the ones she has not been published in. She is, with her husband, the co-founder of Shop Black, an uh, initiated Lukumi Sango priest, hoodooist and New Orleans native, and she can be found waxing poetic about all things African spirituality online and in person at the Buku Hoodoo Shop. The annual Buku Hoodoo Fest this October and within her community, ATRS Book Club. Everyone, please join me in welcoming tonight's guests. Good evening, good evening, good to see you. Thank you so much for taking time out of your schedules to join us in conversation. Thanks to the Free Library for hosting us, Uncle Bobby's for selling books, and most especially Chantrell for taking time out of her busy African schedule to be with me tonight. I couldn't think of anyone else I wanted to talk to. When we're talking about imagination, Chantrell manifests her imagination, so we're gonna learn a lot. Um, to get started, I thought we'd do just a little exercise to start to stretch um, our thinking a bit. Um, so for this, I'm going to ask um, the front of the auditorium. So let's say, can you raise your hand with the scarf right here? Yeah. So everyone in front of, of uh, this person, um, your mantra is be bold, OK? Everyone behind, your mantra is get real. <laughs> Got it? And when, I, when you say it, you really have to say it. Like, be bold. I want you to say it like you're trying to push me up into the air. Uh, get real. I want you to say it like you're trying to flatten me on the ground. All right? So, question already. Yes. So, with that role, how about that role? In, you're, you, you are in front. Thank you. Already, already. All right. So let's just practice. Um, Be bold. Oh, thank you. Follow. Ready? In the front. Be bold. And then in the back. OK, ready now? All right, so this hand is the front. This hand is the back, all right? So space travel. Be bold. Free public transportation. Colonize Mars. Be bold. Decolonize Earth. AI superintelligence. Cancel student debt. Get real. Build underground bunkers to survive the AI apocalypse. Build affordable housing. Get real. Spend billions on war. Get Stop the genocide. Cease fire now. Get you get the picture. Boldness. Boldness is rationed while realism is mass-produced. We are in many ways trapped 
inside the lopsided imagination of those who monopolize power and resources to benefit the few at the expense of the many. These futurists let their own imaginations run wild when it comes to bending our digital and physical realities, but their visions grow limp when it comes to transforming our social reality so that everyone has the chance to live a good and meaningful life. So with that in mind, I thought I'd share three short brief experiences or touchstones that have shaped my own relationship uh, to innovation, to inequity, to imagination. Before I do though, I should say that I come from many Souths. I was born in Southern India. I was raised equal parts in South Carolina, South Central LA. I spent my youth in the South Pacific, Southern Africa, and Southwest Atlanta. So I bring this perspective of looking at the world from its underbelly to all my work. So the first experience is when I was around 15 years old, my family packed up house in South Carolina and moved to the Marshall Islands in the middle of the Pacific. We lived on Majuro, the capital, but after I made some friends, they wanted to uh, show me around a bit. So we went to some of the outer islands, the other atolls, and one of the first places we went was a pair of islands, Kwajalein and Ibai. Kwajalein is where there is a US military base. And if you just landed there, you would think you were in the middle of Stepford Wives. It was a, just a classic suburbia. Golf courses, Bas Baskin Robbins, people walking around with strollers. You would have no idea you're in the South Pacific. A very short ferry ride next to Kwajalein was Ibai, which is some call the, the ghetto of the Pacific. Very little vegetation, most people living in makeshift tin homes, TB rate 26 times that of the US. And that is where people who were pushed off of Kwajalein were meant to reside. A history of displacement. They need special passes to come to Kwajalein. And so this was at 15 years old, my, one of my first encounters of seeing essentially the idea that a purported utopia needs a dystopia. There's a relationship between those. It's not really parallel realities, but one requires the other. Fast forward now, I'm in my 20s, grad school, the Bay Area. Around the time, just before the kind of tech boom as we know it, there was a biotech boom, where the state was investing $3 billion into stem cell research because of a federal prohibitions against this particular arena. And um, the proponents of stem cell research, they created a ballot measure where Californians could go and vote for this investment, which would eventually create a new state agency devoted to stem cell research, a new constitutional right to research, and of course, lots of funding. On this ballot that we, was that, you know, that we went to go to make this decision, Prop 71 was, again, investing in the future of medicine. The very same ballot had Prop 72 which would have extended worker-based health care to the vast majority of Californians, which was voted down. So you see, we can imagine the future of medicine, but the things that we could do yesterday to improve people's quality of living, our imaginations grow limp. Billions poured again into the future of medicine, health care for all somehow far-fetched. One headline I recall a journalist writing about this field, it said, imagine cardiac cells beating in a petri dish. Because one of the goals of this line of research is that if any of us need an organ donation, we won't have to go to someone else. We can take a little bit of our own cells and reverse engineer it and grow our own organs. Sci-fi level research. But again, heart cells growing in a petri dish, but 
imagining empathy for other human beings in our everyday lives by extending public goods, that's somehow outlandish. Fast forward a few months ago. I was back visiting Atlanta, which is where I went to college. Now, one of Atlanta's sort of branding sort of mantras is that it's Silicon Peach, or Techlanta, fastest growing tech hub in the country, but it's also the city with the highest income inequality in the country. Related, because often with tech booms, people who've lived in a place for generations are displaced and discarded. Now, it just so happens in the last few years, the city of Atlanta is investing not only in technology, broadly speaking, but in Cop City, a $90 million facility that would train law enforcement from all over the country. Because, of course, when inequality grows, you have to manage that inequality through more policing. And so as part of building this facility, they would have to cut down one of the four lungs of Atlanta, Wilani Forest. And so residents have been organizing. At one city uh, hall meeting, parents, people, all, you know, all backgrounds were there. They had a little kid, kid zone set up where the kids could play while the, the parents expressed their opposition to Cop City. And one of my comrades there sent me a photo of a drawing that a, a child did. And it had a question on it. What did cops do? to deserve a playground. Because their own school was shuttered in the shadow of Cop City. You see, you see this lopsided investment where education is being defunded, but we have plenty to pour into more policing. And yet there's a historic mobilization of residents, again, from all walks of life, ATLians pushing back against the militarizing imagination of city officials and corporations helping to fund the cop city, from college students to clergy, environmental activists to indigenous leaders. These forest defenders are inviting us into an alternate imagination of the future where our social and ecological well-being are interconnected, but not without a price. In November, 61 Cop City protesters were arraigned on bogus racketeering and domestic terrorism charges, most facing between five and 20 years in prison for nonviolent protest, all in an attempt to silence the movement, setting a vile and dangerous precedent. And in just the last few days, Georgia's Senate passed a bill criminalizing state bail funds for protest groups and making it illegal for charitable organizations to bail out more than three people a year. So the struggle continues. Like Atlanta's forest defenders, we have to be bold when it comes to our social vision. But how? I think the first step is to stop policing the borders of our own imagination. A world without prisons? Ridiculous. Schools that foster the genius of every child? Naive. Work that doesn't drive us into the grave? Impossible. A society where everyone has food, shelter, love, in your dreams. Exactly. Thank you for your attention. in uh, <laughs> black institutional style by preaching. Okay, a good word. I'm like, I'm sitting there mesmerized. Like, we have to be in conversation. <laughs> yes, we do. After that, hey, girl, hey. hey. This is the first time that we're Wild. meeting. And yet, I feel like you're my sister. Absolutely. Okay. <laughs> I mean, for over a decade yes, now at this decade. point. Yes, a decade. It's crazy. Um, but that's the black imagination, yes. right? That's the imagination. Yes. The fact that we've connected over technology. There we go. And now we're here yep. communicating, interacting with one another. So I just want to say congratulations, Thank first you. of all. I love the book. Thank love, love, love. You. It's great. It's necessary. Um, I think it's very important, particularly in this moment. Um, there's so much going on. And we're, uh, I don't know how into a strategy you are, but 
we're shifting from Pluto being in Capricorn to Pluto being in Aquarius. And mm -hmm. so in, in times, the last time this happened, um, the Haitian Revolution happened, right? <laughs> It was on the heels of the French Revolution, and you all can look this up. So there was a lot of systems being dismantled, mm -hmm. right? And then, again, you talk about the Haitian Revolution, somebody was imagining something, yes. right? Yes. Haitians that defeated, at that point in time, the world's greatest military power <laughs> to create the first black independent nation in the new world, <laughs> only second to the United States of America. Mm -hmm. So... I think it's, 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 it's wonderful that we're having this conversation yeah. right now, that you gave us this right now. Mm -hmm. And I want to begin uh, in a way that is very Sankofic, <laughs> which, you know, the young mm -hmm. folks, they're like, happy Black Futures Month. Yes. And I'm like, what's wrong <laughs> with Black History? Because <laughs> even from an African-centered perspective, in a Sankofic perspective, yes. Black History is Black present, yes. is Black Future, which is something that you talk about mm -hmm. in the book. Um, let's begin with the ancestors. Yes. Who were the, your ancestors mm -hmm. whose imagination allowed you to be here today? Oh my goodness. You see heavy hitting. <laughs> All right. Should have asked these questions ahead of time. Mm -hmm. You know, all so many to name, you know, in viral justice early on, I talk about the influence of my grandmother, Paulitha V. White, hailing from Arkansas through Georgia, through Texas, landed in Watts and then Lamert Park. And so any room I walk into, she's there. And I talk about how in the way that she showered me with love, even when I was getting in trouble. Mm -hmm. She was modeling for me what I think of as an abolitionist imagination, substituting castigation with care, and really living this idea that whatever you want to grow, you have to water it, you know? So really that, her influence on me. I think in terms of, you know, my work, one of my touchstones is uh, Octavia E. Butler. And, you know, we know her for her fiction, but one of the things I would really encourage if you, you know, are Octavia fan is to try to visit her papers in the Huntington Library and see her nonfiction, that is her marginalia, her notes to self, because, you know, she created worlds for us to inhabit through her writing, but she was fashioning her own life world right. in a way that is such a model that is, you know, coming from working class, family, single mother, really writing herself into existence. And you can see it from her childhood all the way through to the point where, you know, she, she's saying, I will be a New York Times right, bestseller. bestseller. Yeah. <laughs> so be it, see to it. And just that phrase that you see in her writing to me is like such a touchstone for anything that we do, so be it, see to it, calling it in. Manifesto is manifesting, right. you know, this what you want. And so certainly she looms really large as an ancestor um, in terms of the intellectual and creative work that I'm doing. So I'll stop there. I'll put Grandma White and Octavia E. Butler as two among many. But the fact is, you know, I'm never alone. I feel, and as you know, you also, you know, there are multitudes around us in terms of our, our, our spiritual genealogy. And so we're just in the flesh. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. And I, I love the fact mm -hmm. that you led us to my next question, which is around uh, black spirituality, yes. particularly African sacred technologies and traditions and religions and where they fit because you talked about spells yes. in the book specifically you gave the example of richard mm -hmm. um williams mm -hmm. the the yes. serena and venus's father and how he was like casting spells and saying but also again coupled with the ten thousand hours there are outliers right yeah. there did this work but it was the spell work to even imagine that they would be the world's greatest and also in getting them to believe it themselves yes. before anybody else convincing them to believe it. And he imagined what they did, right? So you talk about spells, you talk about dreams, you speak about and allude to this larger dominant culture and 
these stories, mm-hmm. right? This mm-hmm. dominant story, which is we know rooted in Judeo-Christian mm-hmm. spirituality mm-hmm. and the Judeo-Christian creation myth, mm-hmm. and then us, all of us buying into this yes. religious mm-hmm. framework as universal and as sacred mm-hmm. truth, but at the same time then denouncing yeah. all of those sacred technologies that existed before them that talk about nature, being in harmony with yes. nature, yes. that imagine, because it, it was a part of the just the ethos and the framework to interact with all matters of life, you know, um, whether they're human or other types of species as being in this like continuum of balance, right? But then we denounced that for something else. And then we lost our way. So where, in your opinion, because I feel like you you talk about it and you go there, does spell work, does these ancient technologies and spirituality and religion, what is its place within the larger imagination? First, can I say that's why I asked Chantrell to come because (laughs) I knew I was going to get to sit here and take notes, okay? (laughs) And I was really like, I'm like, there's so many smart black Negroes in Philadelphia. She wrote me back. She was like, are you sure? I was like, yes, I need you. But I also wish that I had talked to her before I wrote the book (laughs) because I didn't even call it spells. But there's this moment that I'm describing, so I'll, I'm gonna, if I forget the quote, you'll bring mm-hmm. it, me back to it, but there's a moment I just wanted to contextualize. You know, I'm talking about just the sports culture that we live in, and I'm talking about being a mother of two black boys and that kind of overwhelming push for them to be athletes, and then my wrestling with that as a young mama. And then I'm talking about this moment where um, Richard is you know you see in the both the documentary footage and the film where they're practicing Serena and Venus and he says you are at the US Open and he's saying you are at the US Open and they're hitting back and forth and he doesn't say maybe one day in the future if you work hard enough you might maybe in you know and like all these qualifiers he is putting them there in the future. And then because of the brilliance of the documentary, it cuts to when they are actually at the US Open. So in some ways it makes it seem magical. And the point is though that that sort of manifesting had to go hand in hand with all of the practice and all of that. But this idea of like putting ourselves in the future, there's a word for this in, in political science circles of prefiguring the world we want. Whatever we want to see in the future, we start to practice it now, even if it's in a small form so that it can grow over time, rather than waiting for some future miracle to happen. So back to the question in terms of spiritual technologies, is really when we're talking about where we want to go in the future, so much of what we have to do is to reclaim that ancestral knowledge, especially Mm -hmm. in the chapters where I'm talking about our planetary crisis Mm -hmm. in terms of ecology, and not turning to the tech bros to save us. The very same people and industries that are exacerbating the crisis now are positioning themselves to be the solution. Starting centers for the future, institutes for the future, everything for the future. It's like, calm down, (laughs) calm down. You got us to this place. You don't get to now deliver us Mm -hmm. and save us. So then what do we turn to? And in fact, so many of the things that we need ecologically to heal the planet and ourselves are behind us, but have been cast aside as primitive and backwards and all of these denigrating, um, you know, uh, stories about them. And so thinking about in this age where we're being sold artificial intelligence after artificial intelligence, what we need is ancestral intelligence, Mm. ancestral wisdom to bring that back and to think about and, and we don't ha- again, we're not, we don't have to create things from scratch. Right. We have to listen, learn, turn to these forms of knowledge. You know, one colleague um, has traveled the world looking specifically at ecological knowledges that we need that are continued, have to continue to exist. That, you know, rather than creating hard structures, are creating more plastics, um, not plastic, but pliable, sort of malleable structures, you know, whether it's like root bridges made of roots or, you know, floating uh, islands and homes. So she calls them low tech, L-O for local, 
tech, T-E-K, standing for traditional ecological knowledge. Mm. And again, has written a beautiful book that I'm engaging a little bit here for us to think about looking for other sources of wisdom and knowledge beyond the dominant imaginary that's being sort of imposed upon us. And again, while I didn't use the language of spells or spiritual technology, because you didn't, I didn't talk with you beforehand, <laughs> which I should have, um, it's certainly, I think, a really powerful way to frame it so that we can hone these technologies right. that are in our midst. Right. Yeah. Um, to switch gears a little bit, I know you were in conversation with another sister, Trisha Hersey, yes, the yes. NAP Ministry. Yes. Um, for Love those her. of you who are, do not know, uh, she goes by the NAP Ministry on social media, and her continuous message has been, rest is resistance. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And for black women particularly, mm -hmm. that's, been a, that's been an even harder <laughs> imaginary, right? Yes. Like, what does rest look like? And this is a conversation she and I engage in a lot, mm. um, where, like, what does rest look like for us? And so for you, I wonder, because you talk about rest, yeah. uh, and you talk about dream space, mm -hmm. and you talk about joy, yeah. which are all forms of resistance, I wonder, does one come first? Like, mm -hmm. do we have to rest in order to be able to imagine, <laughs> in order to be able to experience joy? Yes. Do we experience joy and pleasure so that we can mm -hmm. rest so that we can imagine? Yes. Or do yes. we imagine all of this so then we can rest <laughs> and then have some fun? <laughs> like, all these things have to happen simultaneously. What yes, and. Yes, and. Yeah. So I'm, I, you know, as much as I'm about a manifesto, I'm really... Uh, hesitant about prescribing sort of one pathway. I think of these as things that we braid together in any mm -hmm. given moment or time or period or season in our life. You know, one might take up more space. We might be craving one or, over the other, but certainly they're all interconnected. And I do think, you know, in terms of the biophysical um, aspect of sleep and dreaming, one of the things, um, where is Sean? We were just nerding out, um, my husband and I. Oh, yeah, there we go. Uh, we were watching um, a, a video on, on, online about this sleep expert just talking about what happens when we sleep. Not just sleep, but he's made a distinction between deep sleep, which we know like REM, but specifically dreaming, mm -hmm. what it does for us. Not just biophysical, but also the fact that that is the time when we metabolize our emotions. And so if we don't dream, if we don't get into that deep sleep, then any kind of trauma or pain or you know, negative perhaps or even positive emotions, we don't get to metabolize them. They kind of sit in our body, in our mind. And so I think that there is a, a relationship between dreaming and healing and the ability to imagine and be refreshed, to have, you know, to be more creative and resourceful. I think those things definitely go hand in hand, but I'm not prescriptive in terms of um, saying that one has to um, precede the other. And I also think we get joy from work, depending on what that work is too, mm -hmm. you know. I love, I'm a big proponent of movement medicine and sweat therapy. So, mm -hmm. you know, that's not rest per se, but I get a lot of joy and healing from just like essentially crying through my whole body. Every pore cries when you're sweating. And if that release to me is also just a necessary part of life. You spoke about creativity and art and I think so I identify as a retired curator right <laughs> and folks are like what you're curating every day uh, and my um my north star has always been the boys mm -hmm. and as controversial as you know he can be and misunderstood and misaligned as he's mm -hmm. been um in his 1926 criteria for negro art he says I don't give a damn about art that's you know, yes. not used for propaganda. Yes. <laughs> and I think inherently the African aesthetic, African art, black art, black creativity mm -hmm. has always functioned towards something. Yes. Where in the landscape of imagination yeah. is the, and this may be prescriptive yeah. and I'm okay with yeah, it yeah, personally, <laughs> <laughs> I don't have a problem with it, is the role of, and I know my professors at Temple would be like, why are you saying the black artist, right? <laughs> the role of artists yeah. 
and creatives yes. and imagine, imagining. And because you talk about art, particularly yes. for people who are incarcerated, right? It made yes. me think about the Angola prison yes. in Louisiana, which I don't know if you all know, it's one of the largest uh, state federal penitentiaries mm -hmm. in the country. Mm -hmm. Uh, and it, it's, it's called Angola because it's on the site of a plantation that had a lot of enslaved people from Central Africa, yes. from the Congo and Angola. And there's a big rodeo that happens every year. There's a museum there and people come out. There's, you know, these crafts that are created by these yes. incarcerated people. And so you talk about, yes. you know, the artwork and um, sometimes even the the conflict mm -hmm. of work produced mm -hmm. and why it, you know, who's, who's encouraging yes. the work to be produced. Yes. So what, what is in your opinion, the role of the artist mm -hmm. and the creative in yeah. imagining yes. a particular type of future for us? Yes. And I should say on that last part about um, incarceration and art, I'm, uh, engaging the work of our sister scholar, Nicole Fleetwood, whose work you should definitely look up um, along these lines. Um, but I think two things. One, um, I, I think a lot of times the way that movements, institutions sort of engage artists is as window dressing, as a court kind of, you know, to, to entertainment, um, not seriously as a site of uh, knowledge production and world building. And so mm. part of it is to take the arts and artists um, more seriously as uh, co-thinkers and co-builders mm. rather than just to give us a little energy at the end of a long meeting or program, et cetera. So that, that's one aspect of um, how I'm thinking about it. The other is that I don't think when we're talking about imagination that we should limit it to those who are self-professed artists. Mm. So part of it is to think really expansively about the imagination that shapes everything, even things that seem like really dry, boring, have nothing to do with creativity, we, there's an imagination behind that, you know? And so I think one of the origin stories, as I sort of um, hinted earlier, going back to studying life scientists who were doing that incredible work, they would often point to some creative expression, namely Star Trek, that inspired their work, you know? So they would say, oh, when I was young, I saw this show, I saw this movie. So there's this really porous boundary between the things that we think of as like the hard sciences and imagination and the arts, and certainly other things around us, whether it's laws or grades or our healthcare system or policing, these other institutions, there's imaginaries that give rise to the logics and the protocols and the practices associated with it. And so in some ways, this is an invitation for us to see um, imagination everywhere in places that we least expect and not to assume and approach it as a straightforward good. Because there are, as I said, militarizing imaginations. Mm -hmm. There are violent imaginations. There's a one that I talk a lot about in the book is a eugenics imagination mm -hmm. that infects so many areas of our lives, you know, from our healthcare system to our education system in terms of the valuing of different human, you know, uh, lives and ranking and discarding and uplifting some. So part of it is to really see with fresh eyes the forms of imagination that shape us, the imaginations that we're trapped within as a first step to reclaim our power, to foster a collective imagination in which everyone can thrive. That, so the question is, what's the opposite of a eugenics imagination, mm -hmm. right? What do we want, not just what don't we want? And so, you know, I'm struggling in the book with a language for this. And so the, hopefully this is just the beginning of a, you know, our own sort of wrestling. But for me, the word interdependence is one way to describe the opposite of what eugenics is trying to do. You know, this both uh, our interdependence as people and a planet. What would it look like to actually, um, you know, create institutions and, and practices that reflect our inherent interdependence as a people and a planet? What does that look like and feel like? And so I think it takes, it takes the people who have the kind of, you know, uh, logistical, you know, thinking, policy, all of that, which is where we usually start 
ideas of social change, but I want us to take a step back and say, well, what's the imagination that's going to give rise to the kinds of policies, the kinds of practices that we want to see codified in our social life and our social order? And I think that's one of the things that I love the most is that while you're looking outwardly and externally at all of these systems and um, the issues and the problems that have risen because of them, you're also turning the mirror back inwardly yeah. and having us look at ourselves, yes. right? And also understand how we have been colonized, all of us, yes. right? We have bought into this yes. theory. We have bought into this propaganda. We have bought, brought, bought into this creation myth um, in which we have been oppressed. Yes. And so I think you that the idea of you also urging us to do the work, yeah. the internal work yes. of decolonizing, of um, also like dismantling, yes. you know, like this white supremacist ideology that even as black people, and I mean, you even critiques like, you know, us, we both are proud HBCU yes. graduates, <laughs> right? And um, you, and, and I remember one mm -hmm. of the other things that I love, I have to say mm -hmm. this is an aside, <laughs> that every time I like I was reading and I was like, but what about, and then you'll talk about it. And I was like, but what about, and then you'll talk about it, right? Because like when you started talking about your yes. experiences growing up in, um, in, in, in um, going to a predominantly white public school yes. and going into this uh, special program yeah. for gifted and talented students. Our program was called Enrichment. There we go. And so I, I had visuals of going to Enrichment, but I was in an all black school. Yeah. And so then I started to think, well, what about in black institutions? Yes. And then you use those as an example of yes. how we're still policing yes. our students, our yes. kids. We, even, we internalize the, the definitions of excellence and success. And then we just think, okay, if we just have more of us in those categories rather than questioning the categories and the, strat the strata. And so the book really opens, again, with me cutting school. At least that's what it felt like when they would pull me out of school and go to this special program where we basically allow our imaginations got to run wild. We would make up dances and songs and have fun. I didn't know what was going on at the regular, you know, they were still taking tests. And I'm thinking, even as a beneficiary of this, now in hindsight, I'm like, but wouldn't all kids like that? Wouldn't, mm -hmm. wouldn't we all flourish? Why, why only a small subset get to let their imaginations go wild? Everyone else is being taught to follow the rules, and we know why, right? We know why our, our education system is mapping onto our economic order, where you don't want people to be thinking for themselves, to be imagining. You want people to be raising their hands and clocking in and out and so on. And so part of it is to look at the roots of that. And even when you're a beneficiary, you're right. being taught you're special, you're exceptional. All of that leaves, you know, the question, so what's everyone else? Right. You know, wouldn't everyone else benefit from certain kinds of play and experimentation and so on? And so, again, it's getting us to think about how our own lives have been infected mm. with these, these concepts and these forms of uh, eugenic thinking, I think, as a first step to then thinking, how else could we order it? And I do provide examples of school systems and approaches to education in other parts of the world that are very different, where kids don't even bother, you know, they don't even bother teaching them to read or do math until they're much older. They don't even do any kind of testing their whole K through 12. And guess what? When they institute these international tests to rank uh, uh, countries, the kids who've been able to play more with no testing out test everyone else. Because they're like, oh, this is stupid. Let me just get this over with, you know? But the idea that they take play seriously and what all we can learn from play rather than having this kind of rote, uh, you know, approach. So the alternatives are already around us. We just need to learn from them, grow them, and demand them if we think that they work. I say, what I love um, about what you also do is you acknowledge all of those disparities, but also talk about and give those examples in these other mm -hmm. countries, right, in Finland mm -hmm. and other places. But you also cite the work of one of your Spelmanites, mm -hmm. um, fellow Spelman alum, mm -hmm. about um, black kids in the school system and uh, Atlanta yes, that Ariana were President. making this play money yes. and like yes. making stacks of money so that they're yes. creating it in, in, in a system, in a, a situation where they didn't have it, yes. have access Even to it. Even under the harshest conditions where it's highly disciplined, you know, so much discipline and structure and like people are trying to squash their spirits. You know, my colleague Patricia Williams calls it spirit murder. Even under those conditions, 
by any means necessary. They're finding ways to experiment, play, create this, their own money, actual, you know, exchanging, doing things with it. And so that, that sort of spirit persists despite all attempts to kind of squash it. And I believe that has been the trajectory of us as black people yes. in the West since like post my alpha, the entire, we've always been imagining, creating, yeah. manifesting, innovating, creating the spirituals, jazz in the belly. You talked about the hum in the belly of a, it was, it brings me to Nikki Giovanni mm -hmm. and her, you know, the Nikki Giovanni project in that film mm -hmm. and like this, this hum, like creating this music and in the ghetto, right? Like the TikTok videos that go viral, these black kids creating and imagining and being and being free in spite of all of this, these systems that would negate their very humanity. Um, I know we are almost at time in terms of the questions for myself, um, and we're gonna open up to the Q&A from the audience. To bring up Nikki Giovanni and her talking about <laughs> black folks from Mars, right, are going to <laughs> have Mars. Have you watched it yet? I have, yes. actually, I did. <laughs> and uh, she says, if to read from um, this poem, she says, when we go to Mars, it's the same thing, it's middle passage. When a rocket ray glares, the astronauts will be able to see themselves pull away from Earth. As the ship goes deeper, they will see a sparkle of blue. And then one day, not only will they not see Earth, they won't know which way to look. And that is why NASA needs to call Black America. <laughs> so I ask you then, if I had to ask you one last question, in your, cause you, you outline four futures, right? Uh, a possible future, a probable future, um, was it a, an aspirational future? There was these four futures that you outlined and my question to you is, in the brightest, most ideal, most wonderful, mm -hmm. enjoyable future mm -hmm. that we can experience, what is happening and when is that taking place? I mean, part of me wants to cop out and say that one person, much less a professor teaching in this little bubble called Princeton should not be the one to articulate that feature. Um, for me, I think I'm really uh, committed to this idea of not the end point, but how we get there. So for me, the most desirable future is not, you know, a utopia where I can sort of paint it for you, but it's about the process in which the lowliest, the most discarded, the most, you know, the outsider, has a key role in shaping that. So part of it is like thinking about the process of who and what gets to have a say in moving us in that direction and really thinking about what that looks like, mm. right? Rather than necessarily um, painting a utopia for you. Because as I say, I feel like that's always a hazardous you know, endeavor. Um, I think it was Toni Morrison, you know, she says, I think utopias are created by those who are not allowed in, mm. you know? Mm -hmm. And so always thinking about that as a very hazardous prospect. And so what does it look like to actually work together collectively to engender, uh, you know, um, the kind of decision making and, you know, cohabiting and thinking about all of the things we need and the things we don't need that will make us flourish and sustain us. And so I think the book is an invitation for more of us to feel like we have the power to do that and to do that collectively. Yeah. And you do that so well. Thank you. Ruha, thank you so much. <laughs> thank this you for your question. <laughs> I will say also that um, my master plan is to get a spaceship, though, so in case we got to get the fuck up out of here. <laughs> Babe, girl, you, your, your husband, your boys, oh, y'all got seats on seats that. Oh, y'all got seats on that joint. Oh. If y'all want to know what Chantrell is working on, 
she's working on the resources to get yes. the spaceship in case we got to get the fuck up out of here. You. Okay. I love Respectfully. You. It reminds me of it reminds me of this Erica Badu video where she's like, I've been trying so hard, hard to, to like, get the aliens to up. abduct me. Like she's like, What do I have to do to get abducted? She's like, I'm trying so hard. I was cracking up. Good evening. Good evening. Yeah. First this was a fantastic uh, conversation. <laughs> so thank you to both of you. Uh, from the question to the book, absolutely amazing. Uh, my name is Pierre Christophe Gam. I'm a visual artist. Uh, and actually the reason why I'm in Philadelphia is actually very happy to meet you. See? Me and Shancho were connected as well digitally See? many years ago. <laughs> um, the reason why I'm in Philadelphia is because I'm doing a project with Penn and I'm building, um, I call it the global mapping of dream. A and global, it's a mapping, global of mapping of dreams. Of dreams. And this is exactly the, the, oh. the same philosophy. Yeah. And essentially what I'm doing is that I'm going to be engaging with the global African diaspora mm -hmm. in the radical imagination of our world. Mm -hmm. um, and so when I was listening to what you were saying and, yeah. uh, and the connection with ancient African yeah. wisdom, so you call it technology. So my whole, uh, the framework of this ritual mm -hmm. is informed by Ifa. So the tradition of the Yoruba. So yeah. it's a... Uh, I mean, it's not really your question. <laughs> I'm just looking at this and saying that this is absolutely so amazing. So y'all go look it up, the global mapping of <laughs> the dreams. The global mapping of dreams. So we're doing the symposium <laughs> next you. month. I'm so uh, thrilled And the investigation is going to start um, after that. Oh. I'm using technology because actually I've built uh, the space. So, the, so it's a temple informed by IFA. Oh. And I call it the sanctuary of dreams. Oh. So it's very much I'm aligned so with your, your, your work That's and philosophy. So yeah. And very much the idea of it is to engage the global diaspora, but as well, like you were saying, the people that have the less agency yeah. and, and, and access and yeah. platform, yeah. Uh, but very much making them see that we are co-creators of reality. That's right. And that the world in which we live is nothing more than the materialization yeah. of our dream and imagination. Yeah. Um, so, it. yeah, remarkable. I Thank love you. it. So much Let's alignment. See. And I'm going to connect this to y'all. Yes, yeah. <laughs> nice to meet you. Thank you for your presentation. My question is, Basically, I didn't read the book, so I don't know. It just so came out know. yesterday. Oh, but so oh, you're thank you. Fine. You can get it up there. <laughs> <laughs> so 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 if you had read it, I would be. I would have been oh, worried if thank you had read God. <laughs> I want to hear a little more about your critique of AI, and also Kenya is becoming the new site of mm. technology and these companies yeah. are paying these Kenyans two dollars yes. an hour Believe to do that me. yes yes I yes know. I would I, like a few you years ago I was that. in Nairobi again every place in the world has its version of it there it's silicon savannah <laughs> um, and you're right in terms of the outsourcing of labor and the exploitation and at the same time in the last few months Kenyan workers who um, are you know essentially cleaning the internet for us and cleaning these these AI um, systems for us are unionizing and so they're they're fighting back against that exploitation and I think one of the first um, places to do that but there's a rant early on in the book it was much later and then I was like oh they might not read till the end so I brought it earlier <laughs> Um, that's a few pages um, that is uh, essentially talking about the quasi-religious ideology behind um, our tech industry and a, a lot of the tools that were being sold called um, in, you know, either long-termism, effective altruism. There's a whole cluster of concepts that are used to dub this this essentially a, a, a religion behind the technology in terms of what's motivating the creation of certain tools. And you know, part of it is to link what on the surface seems like they're offering us something new, a vision of the future, a long-term future in which essentially they see us eventually discarding these meat suits and uploading our consciousness into you know, the system, into the network. And so the the eugenic aspect of this is that they're encouraging us not to worry about these pesky problems like uh, pandemics and world hunger and war, you know, these short-term problems. We have to really ensure that elites in the West survive to upload their consciousness in the future for the best betterment of all of humanity. So this is one of the kind of motivating tenets behind a lot of this. And so when we start to look at the whole marketing of AI, I mean, a first question is like, whose intelligence? Mm. Whose intelligence? Who, what model of the mind 
is being used to train these systems? With what underlying values, assumptions, ideologies, you know? And so we have to pull back the screen. And one of the things we find when we pull back the screen is what some call the artificial, artificial intelligence. The human labor, as you're saying, in terms of the click workers, the ghost work, as some colleagues call it. You know, to think about what it actually takes to produce the seemingly magical <laughs> responses and, and uh, you know, um, the outputs that we experience. And so part of it is bringing it back down to earth, out of the magical sphere, and thinking about not only the, our experience as users of these systems, when we notice the inaccuracies, the biases, then we start to question the issues of private data privacy, um, but also the labor and also the environmental impact of these systems, that to train one algorithm can be as much energy as the lifetime of five cars. Mm -hmm. So we start, we call it things like the cloud, but it has a very material impact in terms of the water that's required to cool data centers, in terms of, as we know, in terms of the Congo and the other minerals and so on mm -hmm. that are required. So part of it is to really wrestle with the costs uh, of creating these and to ask ourselves whether it's worth it. Yeah. One last thing that I'll say is that the first original cover of this was done by a phenomenal artist who happened to use one of these image generating tools as part of her process. She's a brilliant um, artist and um, I didn't know the actual process, what went into it, the tools, and when I posted the original cover, people came out of the woodwork to school me, to let me know that in fact this tool that, that was used is, was created by stealing the artwork of millions of other artists to train the AI so that it could then be useful. And I didn't know, I had a very steep learning curve. And so I had to go back to the press and say, well, I can't write a book and publish a book about imagination and the work of all these artists are being stolen to create the cover. Like there's a, there's a fundamental hypocrisy with that. And so we end up with this uh, photograph, Creative Soul Photography, I think out of Atlanta. Beautiful. But again, the implications of the fact that the ubiquity of these tools, I think we can't, I, I was focusing on the beauty of the image, mm -hmm. the output, how, you know, was just uh, aesthetically so pleasing. And what, when it comes to AI, we have to care as much if not more about are the inputs, mm -hmm. what actually goes into the creation of this, because we're going to be sold all kinds of beautiful outputs mm -hmm. that make our lives more convenient, more diverse, et cetera, and what's being hidden is what it takes to get there, and that's mm -hmm. what we have to demand more accountability for, and we're starting to see that just in the last few months. EU passed an AI act, I think um, Biden just signed one a few months ago, so there's more attention at the regulatory um, you know, uh, level around this, but there, there are loopholes even in that, that we have to stay vigilant. Mm. Hello. Um, I was wondering if maybe you could talk about sort of the process of imagination. I feel like I find that sometimes when I try to open up conversations and go into like a, an imaginal place, that it seems like people like, like it's not as intuitive. So I was wondering if you could talk more about like what being imaginative actually looks like and maybe why some people retain that capacity yeah. and if it is something that's more of a state of like yeah. being almost or if yeah. it's like a process that happens. Yeah, thank you for that question because in fact the last chapter is called an imagination incubator with this under un understanding that it's, you know, in some ways I think of it like of a capacity or a muscle that we have to practice in order for it to grow, right? And there are certain things around us that make it more or less possible for us to practice. I find it very hard for you know, most of my students um, to intuitively or naturally um, just let their imaginations run wild. But it's no wonder if you've been incentivized to always do well on tests, to always get the right answer, to go by the book. Like if you get to the point where in your, my, you're in my class, you've you know, had your life pretty much curated mm -hmm. <laughs> for you in such a way that it's hazardous to step outside, to do things outside of the box in, in many cases. And so there's, again, this inverse relationship between you know, people who are often successful in the world as it has been structured and their ability to think about how the world could be different. And so 
I find most of my classes are trying to build this capacity by giving speculative exercises. You know, rather than regurgitate to me what I've said, usually the underlying prompt behind most of the work is what if, what if X, Y, and Z, and then work together individually to try to practice to build that capacity over time. And so the imagination incubator is just a series of prompts, activities, um, games, um, exercises one could do on your own, but most, I'm really encouraging small groups, whether it's a class, a community center, organization, again, for us to practice to build this capacity rather than what I think we often do with the arts is kind of make it something very mystical, you know, the kind of disposition of an artiste, you know, like it's very rarefied rather than just something that is just part of our lives that we work on and, and develop. So, for example, the idea of like city budgets, what if we were more imaginative about something that seems so mundane um, to think about, you know, the idea that I'm learning from organizers around the country that a budget is more than a budget. It's a moral document that tells us who and what we value. So what if we could be more imaginative about where we're putting the resources away from, let's say, a cop city to, let's say, other kinds of community building um, infrastructure that would actually make us both happy, connected, you know, and again, thinking about uh, flourishing in terms of the broadest sense. So I hope that the imagination incubator will be an answer to your question. Thank you. I just want to remind folks uh, that there are copies of the book upstairs, so you can buy a book. You will be supporting a black-owned bookstore, Uncle Bobby's, mm -hmm. that is based in East Germantown, Philadelphia, which is my neighborhood. Yay. And so uh, <laughs> please purchase the book, and you, you, you will be signing copies, I'll right? I'll be signing, yeah. Yeah, so buy the book, read it, and then imagine Can the we future. thank this one? Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you, Ruha. Thank you to the Free Philadelphia of, um, Library, yes, Free Library Philadelphia. <laughs> Andy, thank you and to the entire staff.